Welcome to Human Factors and the Built Environment. This is Chapter 2. Today we'll be talking about anthropometrics, part of human factors. We're going to understand what the term means, and it means about the measurements of the human body, especially in the relationship to the various activities that humans do. We're going to understand how age and cultural difference uh, factors into anthropometrics and why it's important to study this. So we have two kinds of dimensions, anthropometric data. One is structural or static dimensions, and this is um, where someone is t t standing uh, tall with their weight equally distributed and their fingers are straight. And that's our classic uh, anthropometric data that we take. But we also take dynamic dimensions where the body is working in a specific task. It's important that the interior designer consider body sizes of those using the space. Here we're going to look at several different classifications. The first being the average um, of the U.S. population, the anthropometric data that we see here. And on the low side is the 5th percentile, and on the high side is the 95th percentile, and right in the middle is the 50 percent percentile. And while it may be true in other areas where 95 percent of the of 100 would be great to have. That's not serving 95% of the population. That's serving a very uh, small area of the population. Um, the major part of the population or the average person is in the 50 percentile. Now the military um, was used for these studies and anthropometric data is constantly being updated. Here's some critical dimensions. We can see that uh, the range of, if we just take the first line on the standing height, that on the low side, the five, in the 5% category, a male uh, may be 63.6 inches tall, whereas on the high side, in the 95 percentile, he might be 6 feet or 72.3 inches. And we can see the average male, therefore, is in the center at 68.3 inches or 5 feet 8 inches um, and a third. And then we can see the female on the other side is generally smaller overall uh, than the man in every category. And this uh, could have to do with hormones or evolution. And perhaps this is going to change over time as we all, as humans, have been evolving. Here are some other critical dimensions and some definitions of what these areas are. And you can look on the um, charts and, and the diagrams that we have later and compare these and of course our height, our sitting height, our knee height but more specifically the popliteal height which is the area or the distance behind our knee or underneath our knee. Here are eight dimensions or eight measurements that I as a designer use very often um, and here's the popliteal height and the depth we can see on the seated position that's underneath the knee and from the back uh, to the front um, underneath the knee. The seat breadth or the dip, the width of a, that a person occupies is often undercalculated, of course. And we have shoulder um, height and shoulder width, actually, and elbow height and our elbow width when our arms are out. And that is what I call elbow room. Here's some of our classifications. We can see the on the left side, the maximum body breadth, the sidearm reach, the thumb to reach, the maximum body depth, the popliteal height again, the knee height is different than that, and that gives us our thigh clearance, which is another area that designers often need to understand between a, a countertop and the chair that's sitting in the area uh, so that we can clear there comfortably. Here we can see the differences among children that between zero and three years uh, we have a lot of growth of uh, at least two-thirds of the size um, increase and then four to ten years the growth uh, slows down a little bit but significant changes if you look at you know that you might have started out when you were 21 inches and by 10 years old you're 54 inches that's a pretty dramatic uh, difference and then we can see 11 to 18 years and on up into the teenage years uh, we begin to reach our adult height although some people don't reach their full height until they're in their 20s that there is an 8.7 inch difference between the average shorter man and the average taller man 
uh, the fifth and the ninety-fifth percentiles. So average, uh, as I mentioned before, is five foot eight and a and a third. Here we see women, and the and the height difference instead of being eight point seven inches is eight point one. So little less difference between the shortest and the tallest. But so of course a designer wants to consider all people, and you can see right in the middle there, uh, we have this max comfortable range that begins to take care of people in a wheelchair, a very tall person, if we consider their clearance, a, a, a woman that's much shorter, um, and a variety of people. Intra-individual, as I mentioned before, when you're a child, you may start out at 21 inches, but you may end up at 71 inches, uh, which is uh, quite a lot of growth, a growth of 50 inches over your lifetime. Our needs change over our own lifetime. But between um, gender and culture or heritage or ethnicity, uh, we also have differences, size differences. And then we also have generational variability. And this means, for instance, that we evolving because of better food and better health. This generation is larger than the generation before. We can see uh, quite a significant change over hundreds of years uh, since we've been studying human dimensions. There was even a study done um, or among a white, black, and Japanese, and we can see some of the average differences that we have with uh, people of a smaller stature and perhaps someone from Africa being of a taller stature. And we can see that there's um, quite a big difference in just the leg length alone. There's websites for everything these days. If we look to the right, we can see that the 10 tallest countries, this is not counting actually any in Africa, but of the European nations, we can see that um, people from the Netherlands are among the tallest. This map kind of gives you a, a colorful array to see where that the taller people are in the very northern areas here we can see there's even an average height.co uh, website and uh, the tallest men being from the Netherlands um, standing at six feet the shortest from Indonesia at 5.2 and then we can see the women are smaller across the board as well now this doesn't mean that people have been mixed across the globe and that um, we need to consider as designers from person to person whom we are designing for here we can see some of the ways that a designer applies anthropometric data. For instance, if we look at um, our clearance, which is the second line down, the space needed to maneuver, and we think in terms of someone making their bed, um, we're going to think that if we have an adequate clearance and someone can turn around and make their bed and move their arms as they need to, that they're going to be much more comfortable if they have better clearance. It's also going to tie into their efficiency. If you, for instance, had a bed that was placed next to a wall, you're not quite very efficient when you're trying to get your your sheet onto the other side of the bed against the wall. It's also not all that safe if you don't have enough room to maneuver around there. It all ties into aesthetics at the end. So I want you to th consider these different constraints. Understand that they do apply to designers and these are the ways that we can um, help people by giving them proper clearances um, in order to be able to move around, um, understanding the reach that they need, understanding the limits of our body that we cannot fit into, you know, areas that are super small. Um, so just being very thoughtful in use of this data. And that goes on into workspace. So one of the ideas about being um, efficient is that you can reach everything. So under the importance principle, um, for instance, we would place anything that was important within our most accessible location. So that's within our arm's reach. That kind of ties in with the frequency of use principle as well. If you're going to use something very often, let's make it the most accessible location. The function principle. That's a different way to approach, say, a desk design where we put things that are about writing and thinking in one area and we think we put things that are more machinery we're going to use in a different kind of area. You can see where all of these sort of meld into each other. These are four very good things that you can use to help you think about a certain layout. Our anthropometrics ties in with seating comfort. Obviously the seat dimensions. If we are a very large person and we're sitting in a 15 inch wide seat, well that is going to get to us over time. So when we're using it, does it cause us aches and pains? Is it restricting our circulation? Um, is it reactive? 
receptive to us? Are, is it responding to our needs? And are we sitting in it for a very long period of time? Obviously, duration matters. When we go to a quick serve restaurant, we're going to sit in a plastic chair. It's very uncomfortable if we were there for an hour or two, but they don't want you to be there for an hour or two. So duration is a very important dimension when we're talking about seating comfort. So here's a couple of uh, videos that I want you to also watch. Um, as we move forward uh, with computer technology, we're going to be simulating um, how people use space. The anthropometrics leads us in design and it requires us to be very thoughtful and apply these ideas. So I want you to take time and really study this chapter because it's the basis of a lot of other things that we're going to be working with this semester. Thank you very much.